So welcome back students. This is the uh, last slide of previous presentation and I hope you uh, thought about it and put it in the, uh, the posts. Why do we do what we do? Why are you sitting here watching this video? Well, Abraham Maslow had an answer to that, but also Douglas McGregor. And Douglas McGregor was actually one of the students of Maslow, so he's not having a contradictory view. It's just an, another angle of looking at how to motivate people and how to be motivated. What McGregor did is, he went to look at different organizations and he asked himself what's the view the basic idea of human nature of the people in those organizations so for some people the view on humans is on us is we are naturally stupid and lazy and actually you can find this in several religions there are for example some very strong orthodox religions in Christianity in Islam but also in Hinduism that truly believe that we are naturally lazy beings that we are naturally even stupid beings that would just rather sit around and do nothing or sin all day and um, if you hold that view that will of course also show you how you deal with things um, theory why on the other hand is that humans that people are naturally smart and eager to learn and grow now when I look at my own six-year-old daughter I have to admit that I'm more into theory why and probably your parents will confirm this when they saw you as a small child like well from the age I've seen my child from the age of zero to, to six the amount of learning that goes on in her this tremendous eagerness to try out new things to be creative I also have to admit that both my wife and I are very uh, let's say stimulating that behavior in in giving opportunities so you also see uh, children that get bored quite easily and they're kind of stuck to their smartphone um, not that anything wrong with smartphones but the point is how do you view these human beings and you see this in organizations and in governments all over the world for example organizations and, and it's it's less but organizations where the boss checks if you arrived on time or when there's even a time clock to clock in and to clock out so that the boss exactly knows you worked eight hours and three minutes for example or governments like North Korea the North Korean dictatorship where people are really you know subservient to this sort of glorious leader who knows everything and who can solve every problem so he's the smart one and they're the stupid ones now fortunately for us we live in a democratic society and there our governments because we have a democracy believe that we're smart maybe some of us are smarter than others but all of us have the right to vote because the government believes that we are capable to do so and what you probably know from history is that this was not always the case 
even in the Netherlands, there's been a time when women were not allowed to vote. So that the men in, the, in power thought that women were not smart enough to vote. There was a time, also in the Netherlands, that poor people were not allowed to vote. Because the rich thought, well, poor people are not smart, don't have enough cap capacities to do this. So theory X and theory Y. And I'd like you to see in the YouTube playlist, you will see um, British comedian Eddie Izzard and he has a sketch on the Death Star Canteen and that clearly shows the contrast between the theory X of Darth Vader and the theory Y of Mr. Stevens from catering. Now, what does that mean for management and staff? Well, in a theory X, you have an authoritarian repressive style. Think of the boss who says, this is the way we're going to do it. You may think, oh my God, these plans are not very smart or they're, they're dangerous, but no, this is the way we do it. If you don't do it the way I tell you to do it, you'll get fired. That's authoritarian style. Very often tight control, cameras everywhere, checking when you came in, what you did, measuring, measuring, measuring. And no development of staff. So we don't want you to to grow, to become a better person or all that. No, just do your job. In certain cases, and again, that's less and less, but there have been times in the past where bosses would tell factory workers that came up with suggestions, mm -hmm. you know, in the car factory, for example, came up with suggestions, um, where bosses would say, Sorry for that brief interruption here, uh, but where bosses would tell factory workers, I'm the manager, I'm the one who's supposed to think. The moment you enter the factory, you leave your brains outside the door. And in uh, those types of organizations, there are many, many procedures. There are uh, all sorts of rules. So often also the culture is rather um, depressed and limited. You can find uh, all over the world factory workers that are extremely sad and, and physically even depressed because of the work uh, that they have to do. You say the same thing in government, where in, in authoritarian regime, so a regime with a dictator, uh, people don't take a lot of initiative and are scared. And that often leads to a more uh, depressed culture. And we'll talk about culture in a moment. Now, theory why, and maybe a good way to memorize it, it's like opening your arms. Theory why is again, focused on humans being smart, eager to learn. So it's a liberating and developmental style. It's actually like our university. It's actually like PBL. You know, we want you to learn to self-govern, to, to grow, not depending on us. And um, so there's a focus on achievement, continuous improvement achieved by enabling, empowering and giving responsibility. Empowering is a fancy word of saying, I give you the possibility to do something that's maybe a bit challenging, but that I know you can do and you are responsible for it. Think of your own side job. Some of you may do an easy operational job, you know, putting boxes in Albert Heijn. Not, not at this moment, of course. 
Uh, but it's very possible that some of you have much more challenging jobs because your boss said, hey, you can be the team leader and organize things by yourself, and you did. So that's another way um, to look at theory X and theory Y. And in the YouTube playlist, there's even more examples of, uh, of that. So theory X means people need close supervision, they will avoid work when possible. They will avoid responsibility. And they desire only money. They dare, oh, oh my God, it's, it's five o'clock. Finally, I can go home and luckily I get paid. And also, people must be pushed to perform. That's when you push them by bonuses or threatening them. And theory why? People want a level of independence in their work. They will seek responsibility. They are motivated by a sense of self-fulfillment. And people also naturally want to work. It's the same thing, you know, why does Bill Gates, why does Warren Buffett, the billionaires, Jeff Bezos, why do they still work? Well, because work can be fun if, if it's your thing. And people will drive themselves to perform. Again, you are here at university because you want to challenge yourself. You don't join school to just learn the things you've already learned. That's how boredom uh, happens. So here's an exam question. Just take the time to look at it and important thing underlined is pick the best answer a third theory i would like to go over is hertzberg's motivator hygiene theory and on the youtube playlist there's actually two clips, and the first one is the most important, where you can see Frederick Hertzberg himself in the 1970s, smoking, drinking whiskey, and teaching students about his model. So you can watch him if you want to see uh, where it came from. I will give a short overview of the views of, um, of Hertzberg. And Hertzberg made the distinction between what you could call job content, so what the job is about, and organizational context, what surrounds the job. Now his theory is also called the two-factor theory. Some people call it the motivator hygiene theory. But honestly, I find the word hygiene a bit dangerous for non-fully English speakers is because we may think of hygiene, of cleanliness, but it doesn't mean that here. But basically, what Hertzberg says, there's two things. There are there's stuff around the job. And let me take uh, my job at Breda University. So first of all, there's pay. I get paid a certain amount. That's established by law. There's a collective labor agreement established in all the uh, universities of applied science. And you know, according to my level, I get paid a certain sum at the end of the month and a pension and all that. And I have to say, I am happy with that. Uh, you can earn more money in uh, consulting companies, for example, but there's pay and I say, yes, I find that for what I do, I get paid fairly. Then there's 
company policy, the policy of Breda University. And again there, and, and think of your own situation, I'm very happy. You know, all the different services that uh, Breda offers to me, um, the benefits, the use of laptops, the beautiful building I work in, um, but also just the laws, you know, it's, I mean, I get paid at the end of the month on a specific day. It's all clear. If, um, if I'm ill, for example, I just have to call ill. That's all. In Belgium, I have to get a little note from my doctor, which says, yes, he's actually ill. But in the Netherlands, there's a trust system, which I, which I like. So that is again, wonderful, you know, check, tick the box supervisory style my boss my direct boss i really uh, like working with him he um, follows what i do at the same time he delegates so he allows me a lot of responsibility to um, create my own course the way i want to interact with students with colleagues so there's this tremendous amount of freedom think of um, theory why in McGregor and that's a uh, pleasant it fits with me so it's a plus again status well yes there is status in the job I am a professor I mean I mean I have a PhD so I'm dr. Joseph Rubens and having a PhD gives you certain status in society I have to admit that I'm not saying that people with PhDs are smarter or more capable than people who do not have a PhD. I personally, I'm, I'm married to a uh, kindergarten teacher and I personally think that my wife uh, knows a lot more about pedagogy, at least uh, in the age range that she works with than me. And I've often learn from the way she works with four, five, six year olds, how I can deal with 17, 18, 19, 20 year olds. But it has to, has to do with, with me learning something, something new in an approach. But yes, I have status. Yeah. Security. Well, there is quite some security in my job. Um, I remember there was a time 20 years ago when I was a freelancer. So in ZZ pairs, the Dutch would call it a freelancer. And uh, I preferred that also partly because of naivety, because at some point my then boss in Rotterdam, I was working for the university in Rotterdam. He wanted to offer me a, uh, a contract, a fixed contract, which I refused. And then what happened, um, that's now, again, 10, 12 years ago, no, sorry, 14 years ago, there was an economic crisis. And suddenly all the freelancers contracts were stopped. So it didn't matter if I was good or not good. It, the contracts were just stopped because they had to work with the people who have full contract staff. And then I realized how insecure a, a freelance contract can be, especially when during an economic recession, like the one we're going to go through right now, kids, um, especially when during a recession, it doesn't matter whether you're good or bad, but as a freelancer, you're less asked for work. So that, that puts pressure on you, puts pressure on your family, paying mortgages and everything. So when I started working for uh, Breda University and after a few years, I received my, my fixed contract for life. Um, I, that, that's, that's fantastic. I wouldn't want to be without it. Also, because currently I am, uh, I'm turning 52. I've got a daughter, we've got a, a nice house, beautiful garden, got to pay the mortgage, all that. I like 
that security, I, I, I'm quite certain, I'm actually 100% certain that even during this recession, I will have work at Breda University. It could be that I have to take on some tasks from other people who had freelance contracts, uh, but but that security is there. And again, it's it's up to you to see how important that is for you. And then also working conditions. The working conditions at Breda University are superb. Um, currently, I'm working online because of the cor coronavirus, but luckily I can do this. You know, I can, I'm here recording a video because Breda University offers me the Microsoft Teams on which I can do this. I can still communicate with you online and when things get back to normal, um, I'll be in a beautiful campus where I can mostly choose my own hours. So yes, there are there are some fixed hours, but I don't have a nine to five job. I, I no this this morning I'm preparing this class actually like early, very early. Um, but it's possible that I check my email in the evenings and maybe in the afternoon, especially now that I'm inside also with a child, that I go outside for, for an hour with a child, you know. So hygiene factors are important, and in this case, they're very, very good. And then there are the actual motivator factors, which is the job content. And so what does that mean? How and again, I'll, I'll just give as an example my own job. So first of all, achievement. Well, my job is exciting. I mean, I like to teach. Yeah, I, I chose this. I chose this profession. I really did. And um, achievement in a sense that I like to learn. So if you see also advancement and growth, I like to learn. I love to learn new things about hotel management, about facility management. And quite recently, I was asked to design the master supply chain management and work on change and innovation. Supply chains, which you get in operations, was new for me. It's a new world. And I'm reading about it. And not only that, because of the corona crisis there's lots of information on supply chains malfunctioning so i'm really absorbing that i'm also um i have a fascination for the stock market i've had it for two years the stock market and sustainable green stocks and that's something i have the time to do in my job because i'm then allowed to create classes for you so even when I made this presentation a, a few years ago, it's still fascinating, interesting for me to do. So I feel achievement. Advancement means that I can advance in my job. Yes, I could get into a higher scale. I could become uh, an associate professor if I wanted that, so that's possible. There's recognition. Recognition in a sense that uh, what I truly appreciate is when uh, students recognize what I do. I sometimes meet alumna or alumni uh, in, in industry. They're working at the airport of Rotterdam or they're working in the Marriott in, um, in Paris. And I meet them by accident or whatever, or they talk to me on LinkedIn and they say, hey, you know, I'm glad we we studied that during OB then. And, you know, I'm doing this and I'm excited about my work. So recognition for what I've done. And that's probably one of the beauties of teaching is that you notice that you have a positive effect on, on somebody's life. And, and I have to say, I'm very grateful to 
for example, for some of my uh, teachers in high school and professors at university uh, for helping me grow and, and have a, an in enriched life. So the sense of responsibility, yes, I mean, I'm responsible for making sure you learn this stuff. And the work itself, I, I, I like working with students. You know, I told uh, my wife last week that I said, I, I honestly wouldn't want to do anything else. I mean, maybe one exception. I, I would at some point like to open a small coffee bar slash antique shop. Uh, but that's something I can still do when I'm on my pension between brackets or maybe when I do this uh, two days a week or something, once the economy picks up again. Uh, but I'm really pleased with, uh, with this. And what Hertzberg also um, showed was that these are different things when I want to motivate someone I need to focus on the job content itself I need to make the job interesting when your boss wants to motivate you it's for Hertzberg that would be okay how can I make the job more exciting how can you have more challenging tasks to do it's not about, can I pay you more? So for, for Hertzberg, pay is again, it's a context. Pay is important. But if you're bored with your job, and if I give you a, an extra 100 euros, that will not take away the boredom. It could be, yes, that for a few days, I will ignore my boredom and say, hey, I got 100 extra. You know, shut up and be happy. But at some point, I'll be bored again. Secondly, Hertzberg also found out, but not new studies don't always agree, but Hertzberg also found out that it is possible for people to not have motivator factors. So basically, they are not, fascinated about their job but they keep on doing it maybe for 20 30 years because the organizational context is perfect and i'll give you an example one of my old old friends long time ago his father used to be uh he played tennis and he played tennis at a high level i think he was of the the seniors so he was already in his 60s and playing tennis and he was the champion the the belgian champion of the 60 uh, 60 plus range and what he did at that time in his life or a little bit before he decided to work in a supermarket i think two and a half days a week but he told his bosses i can do this so fast so efficiently that I can actually earn a regular five days salary, but I only am in the shop two days and a half. And management realized, yeah, this person is so good. So he was not interested in the job. He just wanted to make sure he did something to get a good salary so that he could spend the rest of his time playing tennis and doing what he really liked to do right so that's that's fine it's fine um, for example there are even jobs uh, like for example certain night shifts that where you have to guard a factory uh, at night where okay it's not fascinating to do but the pay is so good that you say hey I want to do this a couple of times so that I can use that money to then do the work or the business that I really uh, truly like that motivates me. Next slide. Personality theory. Well, I will not spend 
time on that a lot because you've had Lumina Spark, the Lumina test, the personality test. I just wanted to show that type A and type B personality. This is, let's say, internationally still used as kind of a way to put personality into a category. And it is a simple binary, binary meaning two, binary category. Your type A or your type B. And type A, you can read it in your notes, means you're competitive, high need for achievement, aggressive, works fast, blah, 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 blah. And type B, you're that. Of course, in Lumina Spark, we use many more distinctions in your personality. And for now, all I want you to do is just to read this in your notes and maybe think about, yeah, am I more an A or a B? And also interesting, my father or my stepfather, my mother, my stepfather, uh, my stepmother, is she more B, is she more A? Even your sister, your brother, check that out. Okay. When you see this picture, all of you, or maybe there's an exception, I hope so, will say, hey, wait a minute, that's the world upside down. But of course, that's not true. Because we are a sphere, the planet Earth, I think is a sphere. We are in space. And um, we, we revolve, we turn around and all that. And th that's not the way we look. But the first people who made a map, actually not completely true, but the people who made maps for us in Western Europe, with the British or with the Dutch. And what did they do? They put themselves in the center. So London, Amsterdam or Western Europe was the center of the world. And when Western European nations colonized the rest of the world, we would still consider ourselves center. The main reason I show this slide is especially to help us realize that in many cases, it's changing a bit, but in many cases we see our own culture, sometimes even our own city, as the center of the universe, the best culture. The way we do things is the best. How come the French do things differently than us? Do it like us. Our way is the best. But the French may think, why don't the Dutch, the Belgians, the Germans do it like us? Because our way is the best, etc., etc. And during the Corona crisis, it's you, I mean, I know you've been following the news and, and hopefully not you know, too much that you're not too overwhelmed by it. But you probably notice how different countries react to this crisis. How certain governments take very strict measurements right away, while others don't do that or take them later on. I have to admit, I'm, of course, closely watching the Belgian uh, government's rules because I live in Belgium and I am Belgian, but also the ones in the Netherlands because I work in the Netherlands. And it's interesting to notice that actually the Belgian government has been a lot stricter already from the start. So, for example, yesterday, I saw in the Dutch news that, oh, okay, uh, universities will be um, closed at least until the 1st of June. Well, in Belgium, universities have already decided 
to go online this whole academic year. And I have a slight feeling that the same rule will happen in the Netherlands, but I shouldn't say that. I, I don't have a glass uh, ball. Next. So maybe, okay, a question to you. When you look at newspapers, in Belgian newspapers, what do I hear about the Netherlands? Well, rarely do I hear a lot of good news, like good economic news or good achievements. Um, we talk in Belgian newspapers about the Netherlands when there are either problems with the country or, yes, sometimes cooperation. And, um, well, when there's a scandal, we also kind of like to write about it. But we don't write about, you know, the Netherlands, uh, maybe sometimes in the specialized press. I mean, there are some journalists who do say that your government is more efficient than ours. Uh, but in most cases, it will be negative news. And the same thing happens uh, when the, in the Netherlands is written about Belgium. Um, I remember once that on the cover of Elsevier magazine, there was the title Belgium in Chaos. And I was curious because I had just come from Belgium and I had not noticed any chaos. Um, and when I looked at the article, the, the Dutch journalist talked about the national strike in Brussels. And he said there was some violence, okay. And that it would upset the economy and all that. I was curious, so I went to read the Belgian newspapers and there I found out that the only violence that there was is that one car was thrown down the metro, the subway station. However, the members of the labor union of which, you know, the person who had, the persons who had thrown it down, they decided to refund the car to the owner. So the owner got a new car. And uh, the people who, who did that were also punished. So that's, that's only one thing. You know, if you compare that kind of violence between brackets uh, with what happened in Paris, um, the Paris demonstrations and all the, the burning of things and breaking of, of, of shops, that's, that's not violence. Yeah, that's one stupid thing that people did. And even if the general strike had some economic impact, and they always have economic impact, it did not majorly destabilize or create chaos. But journalists have a tendency to write um, kind of use strong language when they talk about another culture. But again, I'm saying that most of us know very little about another culture. Even the people who travel. I mean, if you travel and you make an effort to, you know, either learn the local language or spend a lot of time with locals, then yes, but if you don't do that, if you just go to a Western-style hotel in Kuala Lumpur um, and spend a few two weeks on the beach, you don't know what the culture is. And the news is often not so good about that. So when I ask you, you know, Colombia, what do you think? Very few of you would say, oh, they have fantastic engineers that develop alternatives in terms of solar energy and wind energy. Now, the reason that I know that is because I have had some Colombian professors as friends that I've worked with uh, in Germany, 
in the summer and they told me in at Mejejin University there's these fantastic things being done on alternative sources of energy and they said yeah we, we work together with the Germans because we're actually ahead but I'm not gonna say the word but when we think Colombia we think about something else in Colombia in Bogota the capital a few years ago they had Antanas Mokus a fantastic mayor the ways he, he tried he solved crime using creativity using humor fantastic our politicians could learn from him he got rich people to pay more taxes not by taxing them higher but by really putting an announcement saying listen uh, wealthy people um, I think it would be a good idea if you would pay a bit more because I need it and I'm asking you for your help and it worked so but we don't think about that and so please realize also when I when I say the word Israel people directly connected with dot 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 but we forget that for example in Israel most of the semiconductors the microchips Intel you know those things uh, Israel is, is ahead there so ICT is happening not only in Silicon Valley but very much in Tel Aviv and, and, and places in Israel so but we don't normally think about this and please realize that's what I wrote on the slide that Australians for example they care about news from Indonesia because that's the country they one of their biggest trading partners it's also the country they go on holiday to the most and Japan and the USA they don't know so much about us the Netherlands or Belgium because they don't have to next an important definition and there will be an exam question on this what do we mean by culture here and I'm not talking about high culture art or culture in that sense so here it is it's a set of basic assumptions so a shared solution to universal issue which have evolved over time and are handed down from one generation to the next keywords shared solution a shared solution is lunch or eating food exists all over the world but a shared solution of the Netherlands is let's meet at 1230 have a sandwich with cheese or ham or vegan and after 20 minutes we get back to work that's lunch here it's a shared solution of the Dutch in Spain lunch is something that takes place between two and four and may involve a much bigger or more copious meal so issues are universal all humans in this world face the same things we all have relations but in certain countries homosexuality for example is not only accepted as normal but it can also it's also part of marriage you can marry a man can marry a man in other countries that's not possible and culture evolves so when I hear people say we are losing our Flemishness or our Frenchness or our Dutchness well it's partly nonsense because if we would now go back into time in 16th century Brabant the language would be quite different and women would have actually rather nothing to say literally or could not have any uh, jobs involving using their mind and, and you, would, you wouldn't 
even recognize that society. You say, hey, wait a minute, they speak not only Old Dutch, but they're the way of doing things and what they eat, and it's so different from us. So, so cultures change. They didn't have order sushi any time of the day back in the 16th century in uh, in Brabant. So I'm saying this that culture evolves. Yes, today the Dutch language is full of English words because we all use. Um, applications that use English as the common language but okay uh, it language also gets enriched you know that's the way you deal with it next so again what are some universal issues and how are they different I just mentioned them food relations exchange so, for example, with exchange, we use, in the European Union, we use the euro. In the United States, we use the dollar. A lot of businesses, however, trade with the dollar. So, for example, if a Mexican company does business with a South Korean business, they will not use the South Korean currency and the Mexican currency, the peso, but they will use the dollar as the global currency. I think about 80 or 88 percent of global trade is done in dollars. So even by countries who don't have the dollar as their physical physical main currency. And exchange of goods, when it's not happening with money, in certain countries it's barter barter means okay I have a chicken I exchange my chicken for for example uh, five liters of water that could be barter in a specific tribe in Africa yeah. and by the way bartering is also coming back um, with the circular economy and sharing bartering exchange when uh, there are systems where people say okay i will come and um, mow your lawn yeah i'll work in your garden and in exchange for that you give me a back massage so again we humans have universal issues many more things in common than different and we have some, uh, but we have shared a solution in our group to those issues. Next. Yes, so all these things we have in common, but the way we deal with them is different. So for example, esteem. In the Netherlands, we even have a saying that you shouldn't boast too much. So it's okay when you did well, but don't tell everybody. Whereas in the Netherlands, uh, sorry, whereas in America, I, I, actually in Texas, I have once seen a t-shirt where somebody said, uh, I own uh, $1.5 billion. Yeah, Shows it or drives a stretch limo just to show the rest of the people, hey. So esteem we all have it, but may express it differently. Next. That's, well, just a small question, or not small, but we think that the Netherlands sometimes, we think of our own country, if you're Dutch, that we're so liberal, we're so open-minded. But when you ask yourself the question, when were women allowed to study medicine university in the netherlands well then the answer is only in 1874 so that's not so long ago and again i have to say i, I remember when i was your age when i was your age one of the first things i did well actually i was a little bit older but when i was 20 
with my Belgian girlfriend at the time, the amazing thing for us was, well, I was allowed to borrow my grandmother's car and we were going to spend a weekend in Amsterdam. And for us, that was, wow, freedom. Of course, you know, you're 20, you're 20 in love, you have a car, you go to... But my first visit to Amsterdam with, with my girlfriend was like, oh, this is the Netherlands, you know, they're so open-minded, anything is possible here, we're going to be amazed. Um, and, well, of course, I, I think Amsterdam is, is a great city, but we shouldn't forget that um, being more liberal has been a gradual historical process. And you do not need to memorize this date, by the way, for the exam. Next. This slide, you don't need to read in detail, it's, it's, but it just shows you, and why did I put women at university? Well, it's kind of a, uh, a concern I have. Please, ladies in this room, realize, realize how long it took for you to get the rights you deserve. And even today in organizations, even in this country, sometimes women do not get the same salary as men for a similar job. Don't accept that. There are still countries in this world where women are not allowed to do specific jobs. Or think, it's not so long ago, but think of the first woman in a town, maybe 50 years ago, 100 years ago, who was a doctor. In the beginning, people would not go to her. They would think a male doctor is better. Yeah. Stereotypes, old ideas, they all exist. And please, I'm showing this slide also for the international people. Don't let your rights be taken away. And, and the same holds for men. Um, we have had the French Revolution and all that to help us get certain rights which we now take for granted. Well, actually one of the, not good things, but one of the side effects of the, the fact that we're in quarantine now is that it makes us appreciate our freedom. We're all thinking right now again about the day that we can go back on a terrace and have a beer or a coffee or s something with each other and just see each other physically. We're waiting for that day. We find it wonderful. But think about those people in the world who actually live under a dictatorship. They are under semi-quarantine 24-7. For us, it's hopefully only a few weeks, a few months. Uh, but there will become an end to this. For them, it's always living in, uh, in a prison. What does culture do to people? Well, culture determines how people perceive and organize the world. Now, what do I mean by that? When you go abroad on, or when you go on your placement, one of the first things that you will notice is the fact that people do things differently. You'll go to Spain and you'll say, hey, uh, I want to go to the supermarket at 3 and the supermarket is closed. Oh, it opens at 5. Why? Or we were... Luckily for us, we were in Jerez in Spain during the uh, the carnival holiday before the whole virus thing happened over there. We were lucky to be, you know, bef before that issue. And I remember at at six, we wanted to uh, to eat something, and the bars and the restaurants said no, only cold tapas, and the shops were closed until eight. So we were lucky 
that we actually found um, a little Chinese supermarket in Jerez de la Frontera to buy some bread and, and jamón and to eat something at what we considered our regular time. But so we consider also our culture absolutely normal. Our culture is so normal to us that the only moments we realize it's not normal is when we meet others. During the Corona crisis, I noticed that the Belgian government took some strict rules, a little bit quicker than the Dutch. And most people, let's say most people that I know, my friends, we accepted those rules and we go, yeah, fine, that's smart, you know, the, the experts think that's the best for us, so let's do it and let's keep ourselves to the rules. But we've noticed that in the beginning in the Netherlands, there's a different way of dealing with this. There's probably more discussion uh, before some sort of government takes a more stricter decision. It's, it's, it's culturally uh, related. Um, do watch the first Matrix movie. It really gives you this idea of culture as something that is learned, not inherited. When you're Dutch, when you're born as a baby, you're not Dutch, if, you're, if you happen to have Dutch parents. Because you don't speak Dutch, you don't have no idea about Sinterklaas or anything Dutch, drop and all those things, you have no clue. It's all learned. When you're born as a baby in Taiwan, you have no clue of the language, the habits, nothing. That's all stuff that is learned. It's not genetically inherited. I know some politicians or even especially racists claim that, but it's absolute nonsense. Next. This graph is called Gert Hofstede's Pyramid. And it's key. It basically says that as human beings, most of the things we deal with in life are universal. Each one of us is a symbol of humanity. And that's not a cute slogan. Yes, an Inuit, an Eskimo, has a different way of dress, getting dressed. I mean, it's a lot colder where he lives, where she lives, so they have to get dressed a lot more warmly. And they eat a lot more fish. And it's darker during the day. And they speak a different language. But essentially, everything every human being deals with in the world is human. Getting relations, having emotions, being jealous, being happy. Currently, with the coronavirus, we also notice how nationality actually um, does not exist. Yes, we're trying to stop it at the border, but at the same time, it's a global disease. It affects humans globally. Doesn't matter what you speak, what you eat. So this is important to realize that newspapers sometimes focus, but it's changing luckily, too much on differences. Or especially if a country is ultra nationalistic, we, the yellow people are superior. We, the purple people, are superior. We will teach others how to behave like us. Especially during colonial times, that was the idea. The British went around the world basically saying, and the Belgians did the same, and the Dutch did the same, and the Spanish and the Portuguese did the same, the Germans did the same, colonizing Africans, colonizing native Indians, and telling them, well, we are a superior culture, we have a superior religion, and you just deal with it. Yeah, it's not true. 
So human nature is the biggest. That's inherited. Human nature is inherited. We all have it. Then there's culture, which is specific to a group or a category. Because culture can mean the Dutch culture for the whole Netherlands, but it can also be um, the Dutch Muslim community's culture or the Dutch Orthodox Christian community's culture. Now you can have subcultures. Now you can have generations within culture. And then finally your personality, which is partly inherited. Just like any other human, you will see if you do Lumina Spark in China, in Venezuela, um, in Germany and here, you will notice there are people who just like you have more green or more blue or more red in their personality type, just like you. And there will be things that you have learned specifically. Next. So you can read the slide yourself. What's common to all mankind? What's collective? So we all have feelings, but how we express emotions is different. Simply put, certain Asian cultures, when they're embarrassed, they smile. When they're happy, they smile. When they made a mistake, they smile. We, when we make a mistake, we may turn red or look sad. Yeah, so we have all our feelings, but the way we express it is a lot different. That's why some people say, oh, the Dutch are so direct, because in our culture, it's okay to discuss topics which may be sensitive in others. Or in our culture, it's fine to show when you're angry at somebody to show it. Whereas in another culture, they would maybe they feel the anger, but they have learned not to show it. Think of Japan, for example. And so finally, the individual part. So here's an exam question. Again, take your time to go over it. See what the correct answer is. And now the final one. I'm sorry, the slide is not so good here that it is on your uh, PDF file due to transition thingies. Here is spectacles glasses, umbril, and it's a great symbol because it shows us that in most cases, most of us look at the world in a specific way, not in an objective way. We will always have our opinion about it, so we're not being objective. And there are three perspectives that I think are interesting. The we perspective, they perspective, and what is called self-reflexivity. Next. We will work on it more in the second year. What is the day perspective? In the day perspective, you go to a different culture or country and you keep your distance as if you were a neutral observer. And there, there are assumptions that there are differences and similarities between cultures. So you go to Spain, when we're allowed again to travel to, to Spain, and you don't mingle with the, Spain, the Spanish, you don't speak Spanish, but you look and you say, oh, that's the food they have. Oh, that's the way they greet. It's different from us. Oh, those are the working hours. They're different from ours. So you kind
kind of look and stay well it's it's not it's never really neutral but you decide not to engage when you do that what often happens is stereotyping you would say the Spanish are like this and often it would be followed by a bunch of negatives what I would invite you to do is more the we perspective try to put yourself in the shoes of a person who is living in that culture observe use all your senses read pay attention to the uniqueness of the culture I've spent my working life mostly in the Netherlands thanks to this wonderful country I've had an amazing job I've had a good salary I'm very grateful to the Netherlands and I have to admit there has been a time and sometimes I catch myself doing it where I would say they the Dutch however as I work with Dutch colleagues I have much more learned to appreciate and especially learn the ways the Dutch do things like the topics you discuss the so-called directness the fact that you can admit mistakes the fact that a student can ask you a direct question but also the way your politics is, is organized I have read about Dutch history to understand your country to understand and of course sometimes I'm still shocked by specific reactions or questions but in most of the cases the shock has to do with the fact that in my culture and country just done differently not better but just differently the final one and it's similar I think to the we perspective is self-reflexivity be reflective what that means is to be aware of your own cultural baggage confront your interpretations and values with those of the host culture now self-reflexivity requires courage and honesty let me give you an example when I was 20 32 years ago when I was 20 I was with my girlfriend who was also 20 we were discussing with a bunch of friends male friends guys and suddenly my girlfriend gave her opinion and I remember that I felt awkward and I was really thinking forgive me but I was really thinking why does my girlfriend have an opinion about this issue this is guys talking I think we were talking about the Belgian government or something and only later I mean uh, actually my girlfriend and I had a talk about it but then I realized oh my god I am acting like you know a guy from the 1950s or a guy from the 19th century I'm thinking that certain conversations are only for men and not for women where did that come from um, and yes I could go to my own father and definitely when I observed my own grandfather I by the way a lovely man in many ways but my grandfather really really believed that men were made for intellectual stuff and women were not um, I disagree with him but I realized oops I'm taking on this baggage also in a positive sense when I was at Cornell University in America as a student at Cornell I once was with a uh, an American friend a girl and we were talking and 
we were waiting in front of the elevator and the door of the elevator opened and I said to her please go ahead and she looked at me kind of angrily and she said because I'm a woman and I did not understand what had happened because I was being polite and I think in hospitality we still learn that I, I, I may be wrong and please correct me if I'm wrong but I have learned from as a young boy you know when an elevator opens you always let uh, women go first so that can be your mother uh, your grandmother your sister you let them go first as of being polite being a gentleman having good manners and you always let elderly people so also men that are older than you you let them go first that's just that's something that I had learned but I didn't mean by that that I think you're inferior no it just thought that was proper and then in that interaction I noticed oh what I do from my culture may not be interpreted um, as appropriate behavior for example for that particular girl now I also realized some American girls really liked it when you know I would wait for the elevator or if I would give her her coat they would say wow this is good manners yeah. and maybe it would say it's European manners but they liked it so the self-reflexivity means that you can honestly um, look at your culture and at the baggage that, that it's there and I still encounter it every day um, yeah let me be personal my, my wife is 10 years younger than me so normally people say seven years is a, is a different generation and yes I, I, I notice there's certain things she does and talks about that uh, people who are 40 now discuss and interact and that we the 50 plusers didn't do, do differently so you also have generational differences like just like with Millennials or Generation Z and um, it's important to be aware of that anyways I hope you enjoyed this lecture and of course there's possibility for you to um, ask questions and we'll have a, a booked Q&A also. Bye-bye.